This is the Uploading Files with Blazor mini course. So far, we've seen how to upload one or many files, how to associate files with form data, how to store our data in SQL, and how to retrieve our data from SQL and use it to display our files on a website. In this video, we're going to talk through the best practices around these tasks. It is important we don't get so caught up in the fact that code works that you forget to evaluate if it should work that way or if it should be adjusted to be more secure. Now, this video is part of a mini course around uploading files. I would encourage you to click on the playlist link in the description and use it to go through the course in order. This is kind of a recap, but also talking through those seven best practices. So if you haven't seen how we've done all these things, you might be a little left out, but it will still be very, very valuable when talking through uploading files that you know these seven best practices. Now, if you don't know me, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C Sharp easier. I have hundreds of videos here on YouTube with more coming out each week. I have a podcast answering questions developers have, and I provide training courses designed to give you the real world training and experience needed to succeed in today's marketplace. You can find all these resources that I have to offer at IamTimCorey.com. Okay, so let's talk through the seven best practices around uploading files. So let's start with number one, don't trust the file names. This is kind of a corollary of don't trust users. It's, it's very important that you don't trust file names. You don't trust the last created date. You don't trust the um, even some of the metadata around the file. Don't trust the file names. They can be manipulated. They will be manipulated. That's why in the course, we renamed the files. That way we just got rid of that file name and just used the extension. Now you can go even further and validate that the extension in fact was what that file type was, but we didn't go that far. You could though, and you probably should once you get into a larger environment. So don't trust file names. They could be either accidentally or intentionally destructive to your environment, especially if you start displaying those on web pages or, or doing things like that. I mean, imagine for a minute, if you create a file name, which file names can be rather significant, but what if that file name actually had in it a way to link to uh, an illicit site or a site that was um, something you don't want to associate with. And if you just, just display that image, or that file on a website where they can see the file name, all of a sudden you're showing off that website. That's a simple example, not even super malicious. So just don't trust the file names. Always verify, always do an HTML scrub. If you're going to actually display or use those file names, make sure that they're valid. All right, number two, limit the number and size of files. This Seems kind of obvious, but at the same time, if you forget one or both of these, you can cause some serious problems to your web server, to your storage, to your backups. Limit the number and size of files. People will try and do weird things. It's not, again, it's not something that's always their fault. It's not necessarily intentional. I have done this. I have made these mistakes. And fortunately, I've had systems check and catch me because you know, with modern cameras, which really, let's be honest here, phones, um, if you turn on a few settings, if you change to raw, if you change to, you know, full file size, if you change the file type and so on, you can get very, very, very large images. And this is a simple example. So my profile picture, which I just, you know, take a selfie of myself and there you go, could be 20 megabytes. Well, that's a big deal. That's a lot of size. Now, there could be an argument for, well, let them upload because users don't know any different, know how to shrink that down. And we can take the upload file size once, shrink it down to a reasonable size, and then use it. And a lot of sites do that. Um, when you see your profile picture in a lot of places, it's actually a version of your profile picture that has been shrunk down for that specific use case, because if it's only going to be 10 pixels high, it doesn't need to be a, you know, a full size image. It can be a, you know, 10 pixel size or pixel high size. So, um, you know, there's a balance to be had there, but think about, plan for, and evaluate the limits you put on the number and size of your files. If you're uploading profile pictures, you should only allow one picture. 
you shouldn't allow 10. If you are allowing people to upload documents to your site, well, then maybe limit the type of files and check those as well. But also documents probably shouldn't be in the megabytes. They should probably be in the kilobytes. So therefore, you know, set up a limit there that's reasonable. Of course, if you have images and documents, that will change things. But that's where knowing your environment is important. Whenever you say, this is the rule that I always do, you're almost certainly wrong because your environment needs to have an impact on what you do. Again, profile pictures might be different sizes depending on how they're used. So it might allow the 20 megabyte profile picture. When it comes to uh, documents, maybe, you know, a few hundred kilobytes is all you should allow, but maybe because of the type of documents you get, you should allow five or 10 megabytes in size. It's important to know your environment and set things up appropriately. But the key thing here is to have that conversation. Think it through, know the number, know the size. Okay, I think you got that. Let's move on to number three. Associate the file with other data. Don't just allow files to be uploaded without any association. Just, oh, here's a file, here's a file, here's a file. That doesn't work. You need to associate it with other data. The easiest way of doing that is to create as part of a form data. But if not, then maybe it's, you know, as a user, I could upload files. Well, then associate with my user data. So at the very least, you know, okay, Tim uploaded these files. It's probably better to know what those files are so that you know how to, you know, categorize them or whatever else, but at the very least, associate with a person. Otherwise you'll have files on the, on the server that just, you know, why are they there? Which does come to another point, which is not in this list, but I think it's important to note. And that is that you need to have a person logged in almost all the time. Now, there are occasions when you allow somebody anonymously to upload files, but it's very, very rare. Usually you want to have a person logged in and that's part of that associating the file with other data, associate with that login. So if you don't have a login, then you probably should associate with something else instead. But what that is, you might have to capture as part of that. Okay. So always, almost always associate the file with other data. That's the, the best practice here. Again, these are not rules. These are not hard and fast. You have to always do it this way. These are best practices meaning they are things you should do most of the time and you should be very, very careful in evaluating if you're not gonna do it. All right, number four, store relative paths. Whenever you store a, store a hard coded full path on disk to a file, that's gonna cause problems because you're e eventually gonna move that file. Your hard is going to have problems. You have to move it to a different server. Your um, your path gets too long. You have to change it around. Your uh, you want to spread things out or split things up over multiple servers. You move to a, a storage area network and you need to change it there. Whatever the case may be, you're going to change that path at some point. So if you use a relative path, it's very very easy to move your files around. We've saw that in the last video where we decided to put them under the www root folder of our web server. So we just moved it over, changed the app, set, or app settings config, and we're good to go. We're done. So that is a really big reason why it is, you know, set up that way. Okay. Don't just use the full path. Otherwise you're going through and modifying every single record. Now you may say, well, Tim, that's no big deal because I can just do a, a replace or an update record, you know, update command for that entire table. Well, that sounds great, right? But imagine for a minute, you're in production. Now development, that means, you know, 10, 15, hundred records, no big deal. In production, that may be 10,000, a hundred thousand million records. I have seen very small organizations that have millions of records, okay? Millions of rows of data. And you may say, well, Tim, no big deal. We can run this after hours. Sure, it might run for a minute, two minutes, up to the, path, up to the, the paths, no big deal. Yes, but here's what happens in SQL Server at least. When you do an update like that, 
is going to store a record in the log file for SQL for every single update you do. And then those log files get very, very large. And guess what? You're backing up those log files in your incremental backups, and then you're backing up those changes multiple times throughout the week before you get to your full backup. So all of a sudden your backups get a lot larger, at least that week because of your updates. So it's one of those things where you can do it and it's not the end of the world because those, those log files get brought back down once you do a full backup, but it's still something that's going to take up more space, take more time and cause some more headaches. And potentially if you're close to your thresholds, push you over some thresholds that you might not want to go over. So if you use relative paths, you wouldn't have that problem in the first place. Okay. So something to think through. Again, these are stories kind of like from the field, stories from actual real world experiences where these have happened. All right. This is one that we kind of violated in this video. Um, and again, remember best practice does not mean rule. It means in most cases. Okay. So don't store files with your website. What I mean by that is not just random files, but files that users upload. So when a user uploads a file, you should have a dedicated place for that in your web server, a different part of your web server from your web application, your website. So, you know, you can have a, in, in IS, you can set up a, a virtual path. So slash images is actually a different place on disk than your web application. That's a way of going about it. You can do the same or similar thing in Apache um, and so on. But whatever you do, try to keep those two disconnected. That way, first of all, if you decide, if you wipe out that folder and start over, it's no big deal. You haven't lost all of your, your files. Um, if you, you know, you set up CICD and it automatically updates your location for your web application and it just cleans things out and starts over with a fresh install, you haven't lost anything. Um, also, you're not going to get them stuck in source control. You don't want that. So that's another reason. Now, in our example, there was a reason why we did it on the same web server because we only had one web server set up and we weren't getting into the settings of configuring our web, our web server. So that'd be a whole separate video on configuring IIS um, on your site or other web application or web um, hosts. So that wasn't something we wanted to get into. But that worked and it would work for a small application if you were careful. So there are exceptions again to best practices, but in this case, for most purposes, I would encourage you to store your files separately from your website. That way if anything happens, preferably on a different drive, that if anything happens, let's say a virus somehow gets through all your, your, um, checks and balances, even your virus, you know, uh, antivirus in your server. It would, in theory, only wipe out that drive and not your, your main drive, but that'd be a, the worst case scenario. Okay. So best practice here is don't store your files on the same, uh, website location or, or same file location to your website, or even preferably on the same drive. Okay. Number six, create a backup policy for your files. This is something that could be the same backup policy as your data, but it probably won't be. Because like I said in the video where we talked about storing your, your files, your files might have a different level of um, need for backups than your data. And so you need to think of this not as just a knee jerk, we do the same thing, but as evaluating your specific situation and saying what works best for your specific situation. So create a backup policy for your files that makes sense, at least full backups and incremental of any changes. So how often you do those full backups? It, it depends, um, but you, you should at least have a full backup um, occasionally and incremental changes for, you know, whenever things change, but think that through um, what that policy should be and make sure that you enact it, make sure you test it because a backup is not really a backup until you've tested it. Because I've seen way too many cases where people will create a backup and say they have backups, but have never tested them and don't even know how to restore. And then when something bad happens, 
they find out their backups are corrupted or it didn't work the way they thought it did or they weren't backing up everything or and the list goes on. So always test those backup policies as well. Okay, number seven, last one, limit files to allowed types. When you are allowing files to be uploaded, check those types, make sure the types are right. Make sure that you're only allowing certain types, making sure you're not just running files. Um, try and limit the things that aren't executable and that couldn't be. And, you know, when I put the, um, the file uploads, I checked for, you know, PNG or JPEG or um, the other JPEG. Um, I would make sure those types were actually the extensions that are being used. So that, you know, worst case, let's just say they, the user uploaded a malicious executable, but they put it as type PNG. Well, you know, that's not going to get executed as an executable. Now, I still should be checking to make sure that's a, a image file and the, you know, the data inside would tell me it's not and that would flag it and cause it to be rejected. But at the very least, we're making sure that it has a type PNG or JPEG so that it can't be executed as an executable. So limit those file types to only the allowed types. Don't just allow anything. At the very least, this will make sure you don't confuse your users. Because if you say, hey, you know what? We're gonna ask you for your profile picture and then allow every, every possible file, your user's gonna try and upload something silly because it shows that it's available. So just by saying, hey, you know what? Only ping files or only ping in JPEG. Then when the user goes and looks at their hard drive, they're not gonna find any files except for image files. And then it's on them. I mean, if they upload you know, a panda instead of their face, well, that's on them. And you know what? They may want that. So at that point, it's, you know, it's the wrong image, no big deal, um, but that's their fault, not yours, okay? If you allow them to view executables or allow them to view something else that looks like an image, but it's not. Um, applications are a big one for this. Application will create an icon that looks like an image. So if you click on the exe file, it looks like an image. And so you might say, oh, I want that, that cool logo as my profile picture. Well, it's not a cool logo. It's actually um, an executable and that's not what you want. So make sure you limit those files to allowed types. Okay. So that's my seven best practices around uploading files specifically on the web and even more specifically with Blazor, although these apply to pretty much any time you upload files anywhere on the web. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this mini course. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you got some value out of it. Make sure to, you know, click on that playlist and subscribe to it. Subscribe to the whole channel for sure. But that playlist will be there as a reference tool. So we broke it apart into different pieces so that when you're getting to the point of doing one of these steps, you can pull out just that video and use it as a reference. All right. If you want uh, more information, you can go to my website, imtimcorey.com. I have tons of courses there, free and paid, um, as well as other resources. If you haven't checked out already, we have the C Sharp Projects site, csharpproducts.com, where you can check out all the different product types that are in uh, Visual Studio for C Sharp and what they do, how they work, intro videos for all of them, videos on the different categories that they fit in, which one works best for what, and so on. So check those out. Hopefully you'll enjoy those. Thanks for watching. As always, I am Tim Corey.